Um, so next up, the second speaker of today is uh, Dave Doty. And we're very excited to have him because he's exactly one of those uh, people who is exactly on the intersection of chemistry, biology, and, and distributed computing and has been working there for, for quite some time. Um, having both deep theoretical results and real practical implementations. Uh, he will talk about one specific example of this, but he, he does a bunch of other things uh, at, at UC Davis with his students. Dave, take it away. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, right, so, uh, so it was very generous to say I'll talk about one specific example. It's the, it's the only one I've implemented in the lab. <laughs> Everything else I've done so far has been theoretical, but uh, so okay. So right. So this is uh, this is we're going to dive deep on one single result, and it's this paper we published last year. Uh, and uh, we we you know we had several people on the paper, but in particular Damian Woods and Eric Winfrey were were uh, you know we were all kind of the the main authors, and really boy this thing took a long time, and we we worked pretty hard making this happen. Um, so, uh, but there was a bunch of other people that really helped me learn the lab skills I needed because I knew nothing when I came into the, uh, into the field, how to pipette or use an atomic force microscope or anything. And, uh, that would not have been possible without most of these people over here. So, okay. So, um, I'm a little out of place here in the sense that I don't tend to think specifically about biology, although there's a lot of people in my field who do try to make what we do work inside of cells, but it's not the central goal. So as Tom DeGrieff is talking tomorrow, he's one, of, one such person. Uh, the, the main goal we have here is we just wanna know how to build things, right? We just wanna, that, that's the goal here. We wanna build stuff. Uh, okay, but we know how to build things, right? We, humans have been doing this for thousands of years. Uh, here's some very old, very impressive things that were built. Uh, I went to this one actually last year, uh, when I visited Damien's lab in Ireland, although we couldn't get in, but we went, we drove in the back and just peeked at it through the fences in the neighborhood. Um, and building things by hand or using tools works great for things within a few orders of magnitude of the size of us. Uh, one technique that's gotten uh, popular since the industrial revolution is building tools that themselves build things. So you essentially specify with a program, the object you wanna build, and then you give it to a machine to build it. And an early kind of inspiring example of this was the Chicard loom from the 1700s, which introduced the idea of punch cards. And you'd give this thing a punch card, which would describe the pattern you wanted to weave and then it would weave it for you. And so here is uh, Jacquard weaving, you know, a picture of himself out of it. Uh, now, what we concentrate on is trying to program things that are gonna build themselves, okay? so. This is going to be useful if you want to build things, say, in small, wet places where our hands or our tools can't reach, like, for instance, inside of a cell, but maybe also just inside of, of a test tube. Okay, so, so what does it mean to have something that, that builds itself? So, uh, well, if you imagine you have, like, Lego pieces like this, how do you normally put them together? You take the Lego pieces you want, you stick them together. So you take this blue and this red, stick them together. So what would it mean for these to assemble themselves without help? Well, the Lego piece would have to be a bit smart. It would have to know, you know, I'd, I'd like to go below this blue and this yellow and above this blue and this green. Uh, so it would have to know that so that when you just sort of throw them all together, just, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble clicking next here. But if you just sort of toss them all up in the air like these kids are doing, let them just bump into each other without guidance from you, then they automatically assemble into some complex structure and you're not allowed to, to get in there and fiddle with it yourself. So this is gonna be our topic. And you know, why would we wanna do this? Well, because with molecules, we don't have much other choice. We can't, you know, they're too small for us to hold and do this ourselves. So, so we need them to self-assemble. Uh, and they're gonna be doing some sort of computation as they're building themselves. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of high level overview. So the way that we accomplished what we did, uh, which was to, to create a sort of a complex structure by building it out of DNA. DNA was our structural material. Uh, but what we did is we followed this common computer science approach of having a hierarchy of abstractions. So just like you have these machine level instructions your processor has, but you don't think in terms of that, or even in terms of the assembly code, you're usually writing in some high level language that gets compiled down to the detailed level of machine instructions 
And we did the same thing. So we didn't have to spend the whole time thinking about individual DNA bases. So in this talk, I'm gonna start at the top of that hierarchy. And before we get to thinking about molecules or self-assembly, we're just gonna think about bits, right? We're processing information, information is, is bits. So here are some bits, right? There's some bits and I don't like them too much, right? I don't like the way these are arranged. Uh, I like these bits better, right? I mean, they're the same bits, but they're just arranged with the ones kind of nicely shuffled to the top there. So, so how, can we, how can we rearrange them? Well, we can imagine comparing bits and saying, well, if I want the ones on top, but I see a one below a zero, I can swap them. Uh, and maybe if I compare and they're already in the right order, I leave them, maybe they're both ones, they're already in the right order. Uh, and if I kept comparing those pairs, well, nothing much else would happen. So I kind of shift my reading frame here and I see a zero and a one out of order, I can swap them. Uh, and if I just keep doing this, eventually all the ones make it up to the top. And we have another name for this, uh, you know, algorithm, we call it sorting, right? So we're, we're just sorting bits here. Okay, so there, there's some, some way I could think about rearranging bits. Uh, here's, here's some more bits. And uh, you know, I like it when there's an odd number of bits. I'd like to know, is there an odd number or an even number? Uh, and so maybe I'll just move them all to the middle here so we, I can sort of count them. Uh, so we'll take any ones that are above that line and move them down. But if there's a one below the line, we'll move it up. So this is highlighted. We're, we're gonna let ourselves do different kind of processing depending on you know, how high this little circle uh, so we'll label it by, you know, what, what sort of function it's computing. And we can't fit too many bits in here, just one. So if two ones get together, then we're going to say they just cancel each other out. So we have one one left, and eventually it makes its way to the middle, and it just kind of stays there. But if we had started uh, with an even number of bits, then, you know, the two bits in the middle would cancel each other. The other two ones would make it to the middle. They'd cancel, and then you would not get this sort of stripe of ones in the middle. So we have another name for this in computer science. It's just called parity. We're, we're computing the parity of the number of ones on the left here. So what I've been alluding to here, right, by these examples is a, what we call a model of computation, uh, meaning just some formal mathematical definition of a way that you're gonna do computation. And in this model, it's a Boolean circuit model. And the fundamental object is what we'll call a gate. And this gate, uh, unlike a lot of gates you might think about with two inputs and one output, now, now we have two outputs. So a gate is just any function that takes two bits as input, produces two bits as output. You can describe it by a truth table that lists all the possible inputs and then any eight bits you can think to write over here to describe the two outputs, that's a legitimate gate. So this is like an XOR on the first bit and, a, and an end on the second bit, for example. So that's a gate. Uh, we're gonna arrange gates in what we call layers. So here's, uh, here's gate number three. It's connect, its outputs connect as inputs to gates number two and four. And there's a few more gates. And we call these put together one layer. In this case, there's gonna be seven sort of rows in this layer. Uh, and we're gonna allow, as I said, different functions to be computed at different heights, right? At different rows in, in the layer. So we're also gonna allow randomization, meaning at one position, you could actually have maybe several gates that could be the function computed there and they're picked at random and you can set the probability. So in this example, we could say, well, maybe we'll do this gate or maybe we'll do this one and they'll each be one half, but you could make them each, uh, you can make one of them a third, the other two thirds. Uh, you could even have more than two, although in our experiments, we didn't do that. Uh, so the full model then is that you imagine a programmer, how do they program? They say what gates to put in each row. In other words, what function should each of these compute? And the user will kind of give some input bits that come in from the left side, feed into the first sort of half layer of gates. Uh, and then the gates will just repeat. So, so two can be different than three, which can be different than four. But this two is computing the same function as this one, is computing the same function as this one. So the computation just sort of flows from left to right. And this iterates forever. In the paper, we call this the iterated Boolean circuit model, because you, you put whatever circuit you want in this topology here, but then it iterates. Uh, it's also similar to something called a systolic array from, from VLSI. Okay, so let's just look at some more examples of this. So, so here's the simplest possible computation you could think of. It's like the most boring thing, which is called copying. You just take your input and you copy it to the output. And I'm going to draw the way that these process information a little differently. Now I'm not going to draw all those little gates. 
uh, and all the wires. We're just going to represent ones by these little gold dots here and the absence of a one uh, and, and a zero by the absence of a gold dot. And so if you had copy, the way the ones would flow through the circuit would look like this. And just however many you have, you just have these stripes moving. Uh, that first one we saw, the sorting, uh, would say, well, wherever the ones are, they'll kind of slide up to the top and then they'll just stay there forever. So this is what the computation would look like. Uh, here's that parity circuit where we actually use a different gate, depending whether we're on top or on bottom and it moves the ones into the middle. And if there's an even number, they all cancel. If there's an odd number, there's one left over. Uh, here's one we haven't seen yet, just to show, you know, these are fairly simple computations. Uh, you could just scan really quickly and see, yeah, there's three ones that's odd. There's four ones that's, uh, that's even. Uh, what if we want to know if this bit string interpreted as a binary integer uh, is a multiple of three? So who thinks it is? Just click yes or no. I actually don't know if I can see this. Maybe the organizers can see. If a few people voted, yes or no? OK, so it turns out the answer is yes. This is 27. It's a multiple of 3. And it makes this pattern. And it turns out every multiple of 3 makes that pattern. So let's flip the first bit to a 1. Is, right, is that a multiple of 3? Is that going to make the same pattern? Right, so I mean, this is not a terribly hard computation, but you know, we can't just do it in our heads. I mean, I can't do it in my head. Maybe some people are doing it in their heads. So this is not a multiple of three. It's, it's two more than a multiple of three. And it turns out it makes this other pattern that looks like this. And in fact, every non-multiple of three results in this pattern. So uh, as I said, the, the model is randomized. We're allowed to say, well, you can you know, pick one of two things to do at a position randomly. So here's an example. We could say at each position, we're going to do the sorting gate, or we might just do the copy gate. We call this lazy sorting. It's kind of a boring randomized algorithm. It's just sorting that takes a little longer to sort. So at each point, you may copy or you may move a one up if it's supposed to go up. So eventually, the bits get sorted, but it takes a while. OK, so, so here's some other examples of deterministic circuits. We have parity multiple of three. These answer a yes, no question about the input by making one or another pattern in all cases. Here's another one uh, that computer scientists think a lot about called palindrome. We want to know uh, if I look at the input, does it look the same in forward or reverse? This one does and this one doesn't. And we have a circuit that if it does look the same forward and reverse, it eventually gets rid of all the ones. And otherwise, it, it makes this pattern that if you think about it is just cycling through a bunch of non palindromes, right? If it ever hit a palindrome, well, then it would do the right computation, get rid of this. So this is just sort of cycling through all the non palindromes Now, there's six bits here. So there's two to the six, which is 64 possible inputs we could give. But that input, that, that output is just the input to the next layer. So if we go through 64 layers, we have to, at some point, repeat one of the, one of the bit strings and enter a cycle. That's, that's always going to have to happen. So we had a question, could, could we get through all 64 inputs before repeating. Uh, and we couldn't actually figure out how to do it, but, uh, but Eric Winfrey wrote a computer program to figure out how to cycle through 63 of the 64 possible inputs before it finally repeats. And it turns out this circuit on that one input that's missing, that's just a fixed point. And if you ever go to that, then it, uh, it just stays there forever. Uh, and then here's another interesting kind of computation you can do. We can simulate a particular cellular automaton. It goes by the name of Rule 110, which is sort of a similar model to what we have here, but not the same. It's, it's non-trivial to, to simulate. But these are similar kind of rules based on your neighbors. You, you flip a bit from a 0 to a 1 or the other way. And it makes these patterns that look kind of like these triangles here. And it turns out we can simulate that. We can't simulate all of the cellular automata, but we can simulate this one. And this is a very important one because my co-author, Damian Woods, along with his student, uh, Turlak Neri, proved uh, 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 about 14 years ago that this particular cellular automaton can efficiently execute any algorithm, right? So you just, you write any algorithm, any program in your favorite programming language. Uh, you can turn it into a particular setting of the configuration of rule 110 so that it executes that algorithm. So with enough bits, more than six bits as we have here, we could actually execute any algorithm that we want. Uh, and then Damien was the one who figured out how to do this simulation 
uh, right before he went in the lab and, and you know, made it happen. So that might have been the happiest day of his life was figuring out how to, how to simulate rule 110. So, so these can do some fairly non-trivial computation, it turns out. Uh, there's these other randomized circuits. Lazy parity is like lazy sorting. It computes the parity a little slower. And then there's just some other sort of random things we can do. Random walking bit just does an unbiased random walk uh, reflecting off of the edges. Uh, diamonds are forever. This is this was one that Damien came up with where it's usually just zeros, but you might randomly generate a pair of ones in the middle here. And if so, they're going to bounce out to the edges, come back in and cancel. And so it's just going to make diamonds forever. Uh, so here's my favorite randomized circuit that we did. So what this does is this uh, uses the so-called von Neumann trick to say, well, what if you have uh, a biased coin but you want to make an unbiased decision. We wanted to say, decide uh, where should we go for lunch today? Should we go to my favorite restaurant or your favorite restaurant? Let's flip a coin to decide. But if the coin's biased, you know, I don't want it to be biased towards your restaurant. So how can we use this coin that maybe comes up heads 90% of the time or 99% of the time to make a fair decision? And von Neumann's trick says you, uh, you flip the coin twice. And if it comes up the same result both times, you throw it away and you wait until you get two different results, either heads, tails, or tails, heads. And no matter what the bias is, those two have the exact same probability. They're both the, the probability of heads times one minus that probability. So it turns out we could implement this in our circuit model and make either this stripe that comes down on the bottom or not. And no matter what are the relative uh, probabilities of the gates, Half of what you get looks like this, and half of what you get looks like this. Uh, so, so we get a fair decision out of it. OK, so, uh, so that's the end of this part of the talk, talking about all these different Boolean circuits we can implement in this fun little mathematical model of computation that we made up that we had fun playing with. OK, so, uh, so what's the rest of the talk about? Well, it's that we implemented these with self-assembling DNA. Uh, and all of them work with very high sort of reliability, low error rates. Uh, and you're not really supposed to understand what you're looking at right now. This is a bit of a gratuitous slide, other than to understand it's very small, right? These things are very small. Each of these little dots you see is a five nanometer wide protein called streptavidin. Uh, and so I'm going to spend the rest of the talk explaining to you how did we implement these circuits using self-assembling molecules. But we're not going to jump straight there. We're going to go one level lower in our hierarchy of abstraction. So a little bit more detail, but not at the level of molecules yet. So you think about a Boolean circuit is like this fixed object. It hangs in space and information sort of flows through it, right? But the circuit sort of doesn't move. We're gonna switch now to thinking about self-assembly using square tiles. And what those are is these are squares you imagine float around and occasionally they bump into each other and they might stick and they're gonna grow and I'm going to explain how their growth can implement these circuits. Uh, so we have, if you recall, this gate described by its truth table. This uh, truth table is going to turn into four square tiles. So a tile is just a square that I've kind of rotated here. Uh, and uh, each row of the truth table becomes a tile. The tile has four sides with so-called glues on the side. In this case, the glues are just bits. And the, the two glues on the left are going to be the input bits of that row, and the two glues on the right are going to be the output bits. So we call them glues because when the tiles get together, if their glues match, they're going to be kind of sticky for each other. And if they mismatch, they're not, they're not going to want to stick. So, so that's a tile. So let's see how tiles self-assembling can implement these circuits. So we imagine that we have some glues hanging there in space. I'll describe in the next part of the talk how this is implemented with molecules, but just imagine some glues are just sitting there. So X1, X2, X3, these are just bits hanging there and tiles come in and attach. And right now I'm hiding a bit of detail. I'm not showing the glues because I don't want to overwhelm you visually. So tiles just somehow attach. I do want to say, well, that we describe this circuit uh, as a sort of planar circuit that's sort of flat and I'm drawing these squares flat. The reality is that we're going to think about there being one tile that doesn't carry any data through it, but the bottom half of it is up here. So in fact, you really should think about these growing in a tube that looks sort of like this. Uh, and so 
every one of them is just using these two left sides when it sort of binds, including this, this data free one right here. But I'm, I want to draw it on the screen so you imagine mentally cut it open and lay it flat. And that's what you're looking at. So they continue growing and I'm continuing to hide the glues from you. So now let's actually look at a few glues to get a sense of what, what's the rule by which they're growing. So what I didn't mention in the last slide is actually each glue not only encodes a bit, but it encodes the height. So a one at height at this height is different than a one at this height, according to the glue. Uh, so let's look at just this position right here that has a zero sub two and a one sub three glue adjacent to it. Well, if you remember, there are four tiles that are support, supposed to sort of go in that row and implement the gate there. And their left input bits enumerate every possible pair of input bits. So which one's going to go there? Well, two of them mismatch on one of the glues. Like this one sub two does not match the zero sub two. So these each mismatch one of the glues. One of them mismatches both. It definitely won't go there. But one of them matches both glues. And we're going to say that in this model, we have cooperative binding, meaning a tile can only stick to this lattice and grow it if both of its input glues match. So that's the one that's gonna go there. And if you recall, the, the two glues on the right are the output bits of that gate. So that's the sense in which tile self-assembling can implement this Boolean logic. So this thing, you know, it doesn't have like a gate or circuitry within it. It just has these four glues, but because it's the only one that can go there, then that's why the, the proper output bits show up. Okay, so those are tiles, uh, but they're perfect squares with this perfect cooperative binding rule that works because I like it to work. I, I'm a mathematician. I like to say uh, this is the rule. And if one tile uh, mismatches a glue, it can't go there. But the point is we implemented this using real molecules uh, and we used DNA. So now I'm going to explain how did we make that happen. So, uh, so first I'm going to dive a little bit uh, into just some of the basics of, of this field called structural DNA nanotechnology, which I like to describe as being something like DNA carpentry. So uh, I would guess that most of the people in this workshop care about DNA for its biological function, but we're more like carpenters who use wood and don't care about its biological function of holding trees up in the air. We just want to use it as a building material, but it's a smarter building material. Uh, so, uh, so DNA, if you recall, is this polymer composed of these four bases, uh, A, T, G, and C, with this specific binding rule, A binds only to T, G binds only to C, and we sometimes will ignore the 3D structure in this uh, experiment. We had to pay a lot of attention to it, but I'm going to mostly ignore it in the talk. Uh, and it, rather than representing this double helix, we'll sometimes just draw two strands of DNA as lines. Uh, and they point opposite way. There's kind of a, a polarity to them. So that when they bind, they have to be pointed the opposite way. But this is how we're going to represent it. And one thing that a lot of people don't know is that if you have two strands of DNA that are not perfectly complementary, but they partially are, so maybe this subregion of the red strand co is complementary to this subregion of the orange strand, well, they can still bind even though the rest of them uh, wouldn't bind. And it, you know, we might draw it like this. So what can you do with that? Well. One very popular technology that's not the focus of this talk, although we did use it, uh, is this thing called DNA origami uh, that, that Paul Rodeman came up with uh, about 15 years ago. And the idea behind DNA origami is you start with a very long strand of DNA, and he chose a natural one that's easy and cheap to get from biotech companies in a very pure way called M13. Uh, and you, you, you imagine there's two regions on it you'd like to bring together. And so you design a synthetic piece of DNA that's complementary on one part to one of those and on another part to the other. And so if you kind of mix these, you imagine, well, it might bind to both and, and fold them together. And that's why it's called origami. It's sort of folding this thing up. So if you mix a bunch more of those synthetic strands, we call them staple strands, and you just mix them in some salt water. You know, table salt will work fine, although we use uh, magnesium. Uh, and you heat it up and cool it down slowly for about an hour. Uh, from, from 90 degrees Celsius to room temperature, then they slowly fold themselves up into uh, you know, whatever shape you thought of by, by virtue of how you design these staples to, to bring different regions together. So this is a cartoon made by Sean Douglas showing, you know, it's not a simulation, it's just a cartoon showing how we imagine staples might come in and bind and start from this big long strand and fold it 
into this thing. It's kind of like a raft. It's like the helices are like a bunch of logs with rope holding them together. Only the rope and the logs are made out of the same stuff. It's all DNA. So, uh, so that works very well. That's, that's DNA origami. And it's not the main technique we had, but we did use it for one part that I'll explain. So why would you want to, you know, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to build stuff out of DNA? Well, there's a bunch of applications people think about. I don't think about these as much, but, uh, um, and they're not all biological, although some are because of DNA being biocompatible, but there's, there's reasons you might want to build stuff out of DNA and, and not take it anywhere near a cell. Uh, here's one that is a bit biological that, uh, that uh, Sean Douglas and, and, uh, and his collaborators did uh, about eight years ago, which is building out of DNA, the sort of clamshell shape that has some antibodies inside of it. And then uh, it's sort of designed to uh, wanna pop open, but it's being held together by these two latches. And those use something called aptamers, where if two particular proteins are present, they can open the latches and pop open uh, the shape and expose you know, the, the antibodies inside. So this was just done in vitro. This was not, this didn't cure cancer or anything, but it's, a, it's an idea people have to sort of build these sort of smart systems or you can imagine delivering this somewhere where you wouldn't want them all to pop open only if, uh, if something's present to, to match the latch. So, uh, but I get really inspired by stuff like this. We're just, you know, we're just figuring out how do we really control matter at the molecular level and do whatever we want. And maybe we want to make art. Maybe we just want to draw really interesting things. So, so I'm gonna uh, be a little bit permissive here and talk about my favorite application of this technology, which is something I did about a year ago. Uh, so I made a bunch of DNA origami and I wrote some patterns on the surface of it. And I was really anxious for this to work. So I put a, a very high concentration into the sample and then imaged it with an atomic force microscope. So they're sort of crowding the surface. There's a lot of them here. So I've sort of zoomed in and I'll just let you stare at it and see if anybody can kind of guess what's going on here. What, what are these patterns on the surface? Uh, what does it say? Anybody have any ideas? Ah, all right, somebody got it, yeah. So, so somebody said, is, is it a proposal? And it turns out uh, it, it is, it's a little proposal, right? Because it's, it's 50 nanometers high. Uh, so two of those words are kind of hard for you to recognize, but, uh, but, but this person recognized them. That's her name, Beth Yim. Um, and then there was, there was four other words that I wrote uh, on these and kind of put them together. Uh, and then I, I showed this to her in, in Damien Woods' lab in Maynooth, uh, Ireland. And, uh, you know, it was a very romantic setting here, this windowless phosphorescent white room. And we did some very rapid uh, lab training uh, that didn't follow all the safety protocols maybe. Uh, so that she could give me an answer. And so anyway, I found this to be a very effective application of DNA nanotechnology. Uh, so, so anyway, sorry, I was self-indulgent there back to, um, back to the meat of the talk. So in this other experiment, we wanted to uh, self-assemble tiles that do a computation. And there's a lot of different ways to build tiles, these you know, implementation of a square uh, with DNA, and they're not all shaped like squares. Uh, one in particular is not shaped like a square, but it's a very elegant, it's called a single-stranded tile. You just have a single-stranded DNA, but you sort of logically section it into these four binding domains so that each one of them is supposed to bind to a different other tile. So these things are not shaped like squares. They kind of draw them like these U's here. The reality is they, you know, they twirl around in a helix. But the, the binding graph of this thing describing which tiles are bound to each other's, that's a square lattice graph. So it's still an implementation of square tiles. Uh, and you can make a lot of shapes out, out of tiles. This is something that was done by, by Brian Wei, Mingzhi uh, Dai, and Pong Yin's lab, where essentially they made a big rectangle uh, with one you know, sort of tile per pixel in the rectangle. And then by leaving out an appropriate subset of it, you can make a bunch of different shapes. So, so that's what they did. Um, and these techniques I've talked about so far, this one and that DNA origami, these use something called unique addressing, which is different than what we did, which is algorithmic self-assembly. So unique addressing means each DNA monomer, and a monomer could be a single strand, or it could be like, in this case, a whole origami is a monomer self-assembling to others. Each one of them appears exactly once in the final structure. So you have some staple that goes four over and two up, in this one, you have some origami that goes four over and two up. 
Here you have some tile that goes four over and two up, and it doesn't go anywhere else. But in algorithmic self-assembly, this is going to be distinguished by DNA tiles being reused many times throughout the structure. So they don't know exactly where they are. They have to kind of compute what they want to do using only local information. So we're going to grow them in this sort of topology uh, called it the DNA nanotube. So you imagine we have, we're going to have 16 helices in parallel. And I didn't have a diagram of this. So here's a 20 helix uh, nanotube that kind of shows some of the, the 3D structure of what it would look like for these things to be bound. But to connect it to those line drawings I did before, it would kind of look like this. These would be the single stranded tiles, but they're sort of curving around in 3D space like this. And here is the key to what we did. It was called seeded growth. So if you recall, we have these single stranded tiles implementing this kind of perfect square tile, which itself we think of as implementing a kind of Boolean computation. But the real key is that we, we need a barrier to nucleation, meaning we want to grow these in conditions where the tiles actually don't want to bind to each other too much without a seed. But if we have a seed and our seed is going to be made out of DNA origami, it's going to provide through some single stranded extensions sticking off the side of it, uh, the, the input that we give to the computation that these bind to. So we're gonna start with a seed and in these conditions that we grow, they don't bind to each other too much because they can only bind by one domain each. But if the seed is there, they can bind by this thing to two domains and then they can provide two more domains and they can kind of grow. So this is gonna be that, remember I said, you have glues hanging there in space. This is what they're hanging on. They're hanging onto this origami and they just grow to the right forever from this thing. So this is the structure that's going to grow. And ideally, we would like to know, well, what structure grew? Now that, you know, we'd like to know what is every strand in it? Did it have, did the right strands go in the right place? But we don't really have a mechanism to do that. Like we can't sequence it because we'd have to melt the whole thing first. Then we wouldn't know where they are. So we can grow a structure but uh, we don't know how to figure out exactly which strand is where. What we can do is we can take all the, the domains that represent a one and we can stick a little molecule on it called a biotin. We do this when we synthesize the DNA. Uh, and a biotin's a little molecule, doesn't affect growth that much, it does a little. Um, and the reason for that is that biotin binds very strongly to this bigger molecule called streptadenin, which is five nanometers wide, it's big enough to see on the atomic force microscope. And that thing can help us visualize at least where are the ones. So we don't get the finest level of resolution, but we can see how the ones move around in the circuit. Okay, now they grow in the tubes, but we're gonna image them with an atomic force microscope, which is kind of a 2D imaging technique. It's like a, it's like having, it's like a braille microscope, right? So you have basically this thing that's like a record needle and you kind of drag it back and forth over a flat surface. And when it hits something, it kind of bumps up. And so you can sense how high things are. But these streptavidins, if they attached here, they'd actually be on the inside of the tube. So the way we're going to see them is we start with a tube. And we can image tubes. They look like this. But we wouldn't get much out of attaching streptavidins here. So what we do is we, we identify one single helix we call the seam. And using a different technology called DNA strand displacement uh, that I won't get into, we can remove that. So it's still kind of curled up, but now topologically, the thing is a rectangle. So when it lays down on this mica surface, which it's attracted to, it lays flat. And then and now they look like flat. And now the biotins are sticking up. And we're going to be able to attach streptavidins to them and see. OK, so uh, as I said, we have these perfect square tiles we want to implement, but we're implementing them with DNA. And what we want is to enforce this, that if both domains match, the tile sticks. But if only one domain matches, it doesn't. Well, it turns out, unfortunately, if you use standard kind of energy models to measure how strong in, in, in energy in KCALs per mole, how strong is a binding domain of DNA, and you make a histogram, say, of just a bunch of random DNA sequences of the right lengths here, you can say, well, here's the, the various energies of binding for one domain, and they have kind of a spread. And here it is summed over two domains. And, there's quite a bit of overlap here. There are, there are several individual domains that are significantly stronger than even two other domains put together. So if we use just random DNA sequences, we would not get this, this rule sort of enforced that this binding is twice as strong as this binding. So we had to do some pretty heavy DNA sequence design to get a subset of sequences where uh, just one domain is kind of a little more tight around this range 
and two of them put together in this range, and then we don't have any overlap. So now we get the two domains really are twice as strong as one domain. Uh, and the reason is that you know we, we want to make sure that this kind of thing where one matches and the other doesn't, doesn't stick very stably. That's what we want. Uh, we would like when two of them match, it's much stronger. And there's some other constraints we had to enforce. Uh, low, what we call secondary structure. So an individual strand shouldn't bind to itself too much. That can also be done by, uh, by, by the same algorithm that we use. Uh, so this takes a while to run, but we got it. We designed our sequences. Uh, just a little bit of detail about what we did so you know what you're about to look at. Um, here is a diagram of the, the, how we get, we pick staples up uh, to, to, to put on the, the origami. And it turns out we, uh, it's very hard to use an AFM. It's a really finicky instrument that's an atomic force microscope. Some days it doesn't work at all. You don't get good images. You don't know why. When you get a good imaging day, you'd like to collect a lot of data. And so we'd like to put many experiments together at once, but be able to tell them apart. So what we're going to do is we're going to write some little digits on the surface of our DNA origami seeds just to tell us, you know, uh, what was it, right? So we, we sort of pick out some versions of the staples to have a biotin. And then these three digits, we just come up with some scheme where we say, okay, these three digits will tell us which circuit was running, you know, maybe computing parity and which input was it running on. So we can put many of them together and know, you know, which one is which. So you're gonna see a bunch of digits and that's the reason why it's a sort of multiplexing. Okay, so here's the full protocol. Here's what we do. We, uh, if we want to execute a particular circuit, gamma, on an input X, which is a binary string, what do we do? Well, we mix together that origami seed, which is barcoded by choosing staples to identify both the circuit and the input so that it's gonna show up like in this way when it gets unrolled. Uh, we also mix these so-called adapter strands that encode the input X by virtue of the DNA sequences sticking out of the side of the origami. We mix together the tiles that compute the circuit, but that don't have any idea you know, which input is it. Um, and then we do a bunch of other stuff that's all extremely important. It took years to figure out and it's gonna be boring to talk about, so I don't wanna talk about it. But we, it's very necessary we do all these things. Very roughly, we hold at about 51C for a day or two to let these things grow. Uh, and then now we wanna see, well, okay, did it work? Uh, so anyway, I showed you some of the, some of the results. Just here it is with a little more detail. We have you know the various deterministic circuits with a simulation shown on top, and then the atomic force microscope image showed on the bottom. Uh, and of course, these images are cherry picked, but we have some very nice cherry picked images uh, showing circuits that, that worked fairly well. I'll, I'll show you in a little bit some things that didn't work. Um, so there's some deterministic circuits showing that, yeah, they, they did assemble what we expected them to. At least the ones moved through the circuit in the way we expected. Uh, here are some of the randomized circuits that we use. So you know, one of them was this thing, waves, which just kind of has a one on the bottom for a while, but it might randomly crest to the top uh, before you know, crashing back down to the bottom. Um, here are you know, two of our favorite ones. It's rule 110 that, that Damien came up with, just making the triangles as expected. But as I said, if we could do more than six bits, we could do more interesting algorithms. Uh, and then here's the fair coin circuit that, uh, and I, I said the gates are randomized. I think somebody asked, how do you implement randomization? It's with concentrations. You have a tile or rather a group of tiles technically implementing one gate. Uh, another group of tiles implementing another gate. If you want one gate to be more probable, you put it in higher concentration. So these probabilities correspond to, this is 50 nanomolar of each tile type. This is 90 nanomolar of one and 10 nanomolar of the other, and this swaps them. But, uh, and then we measured, okay, how likely were we to see a stripe or not? And it was fairly close to, to even no matter what, oddly enough, the one that's farthest from being even is the one where the gates are equally probable. But as you can see, when they're tenfold excess of one over the other, you're, you're about half likely to see a stripe or not. And of course, the more biased it is, the more times you're gonna see the same, you know, heads, heads or tails, tails means you have to repeat. And so the longer you're gonna go until you finally get a decision and we measured that distance and as expected, the more biased they are, if you're biased this way or biased this way, you have a longer distance until the decision. If you're half biased, you only have expected uh, two layers to, to get a decision. So you get a decision right away. 
Uh, I mentioned to you that we, we tried to do some sort of counting, meaning can we count as high as possible, meaning iterate through all 64 different strings of length six before we finally repeat. And we felt like failures that we you know, found by computer search a way to get through almost all of them, but we left one out. Well, it turns out we weren't being stupid. There is no way to make a length 64 counter in this model. And this was proven by, by Damien's student, uh, Tristan Steren. And it's a consequence of the following theorem that you know, he knows a lot more group theory than we do. So he figured out how to prove that no Boolean function can compute what's a so-called odd permutation. And it turns out a, a 64 counter would be an odd permutation if some output bit does not depend on all of its input bits, which is true in our model, because we have that sort of lattice structure where the very top gate does not take input from the bottom bits. So it's got an output bit that doesn't depend on all the input bits. So, so that's, that's the reason we can't actually count up to 64. But we can get almost all the way there. Uh, we took one circuit, one where it's kind of easy to visually identify, and tested it on all inputs. There's 64 strings of length six. 32 of them have an even number of ones. And 32 of them have an odd number of ones. And as expected, we get a stripe when there's an odd number of ones, no stripe when there's an even number of ones. Uh, so uh, we all, we had 355 total tiles that we used. So in some sense, we, we, uh, we used all 355. So we kind of verified they all work. And for 14 out of our 21 circuits, uh, every tile in that circuit got used in some input. So there's, there's some sense in which all the gate tiles sort of reliably work together. Okay, so what didn't work? Well, okay, let's just take a look. So here's a Here's an image that you know was collected for, for looking at the parity. So here's a standard sort of AFM image. It's 12 microns wide. It's kind of hard to see. Let's zoom in. We see some of these ribbons after they've been unzipped from tubes. So uh, here's something that goes wrong. You get an out what we call an algorithmic error. There's supposed to be a stripe to ones. It's supposed to continue forever. It normally does, but in this case, the one flipped to a zero. So this is a case when a tile only matched one glue and not the other, but it stuck around long enough to get kind of locked in anyway, and it flipped the bit. So these happen at some rate, I'll say in a second. Um, here's a few ribbons that don't appear to have a seed attached to them. Now, through control experiments we did where we left out the seed and didn't see any ribbons, we believe that these likely did have a seed and ripped off of them, but we don't know. All we know is what we see, and these, these ones don't have a seed. So. Um, and then the, the most persistent problem that gave us big headaches was sometimes you get a seed and there's just nothing growing off of it or very little. So, uh, so the statistics are uh, out of all the seeds that we put in, 61% of them did have significant tile growth into a tube long enough to see the computation worked. The error rate measuring these kinds of algorithmic errors was pretty low, 0.03% give or take. So because we had about 1400 errors out of four and a half million estimated tile attachments. That's estimated from the total lengths of everything we measured, which is comparable to previous algorithmic self-assembly experiments. So, okay, so what did we learn from all this? Well, we have a small-ish, you know, 355 molecules, smallish library of molecules can be reprogrammed to self-assemble re reliably into many complex patterns. So we did 21 possible circuits. There's something like two to the 44 you could do with our model. And you know, if you wanted to, if you thought of an interesting one tomorrow, it's still in the fridge, in the freezer, I think in Caltech. Uh, so we, uh, if you come up with a really awesome one, we, we could still go do it. Um, but we did 21 of them. And, and the way you make that pattern is you, they process information as they're growing. So how does this contrast with, with most kind of self-assembly work? Well, you get a lot more algorithmic control than the, the most common self-assembly, which is periodic. So here's like 2D lattices that just are the same type of tile growing to fill the plane forever. Here's a 1D uh, nanotube that just grows kind of in one direction, but it just repeats. Uh, so you get more algorithmic control, but you need a lot fewer types of DNA strands than this uniquely addressed self-assembly where each sort of pixel in the shape you're making has its own unique DNA strand. And compared to previous algorithmic self-assembly that had done essentially like XOR logic and a, a binary counter, we were able to do a lot more different uh, uh, algorithms. And it, essentially the reason is we got longer domain lengths than, than what these use. These use so-called double crossover tiles. 
just have domain lengths four, four or I'm sorry, five. Ours were more like 10 or 11. So we had a lot more glues to choose from. Uh, so, okay, so what would I wanna do based on this kind of thing? Well, we drew interesting computational patterns onto a very boring shape. It's just an infinite rectangle, right? But the, the promise of algorithmic self-assembly is to have the tiles that self-assemble run an algorithm that controls what shape is it that's being grown. So I'm very inspired by this theorem that kind of got me into the field that I, I read about when I was in grad school. And it says the following, in this abstract model of perfect cooperative binding, there's a single set of tile types, one set of tile types. So that for any shape S you wanna make, if you appropriately encode that shape into the seed, then those tiles will self-assemble into that shape. So you take the tiles, you put them in here, you put the exact same tiles over here, but you put the right seed into here and maybe they make a smiley face. And you put a different seed encoding a different shape over here, the exact same tiles, you know, make a little doll. So the, these tiles are universally programmable for building any shape that you'd want to make. So this, we're very far from being able to do something like this, but I see nothing in the laws of physics ruling this out. I think it's just an engineering challenge to get there. And I'd like to get there someday. So uh, thank you very much. And I do want to plug that uh, uh, I do have uh, some money for a PhD student. So if anybody's looking for uh, yeah, PhD work ne next year, please apply at UC Davis. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, Dave, okay. for the awesome talk. Um, we've seen a, a few questions in the chat. One of them you already answered from Moti. Uh, there was another by Yuval. Yuval, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask the question? Uh, yeah, although I think that we somewhat got an answer already in the second part of the talk. I, I was, uh, if you go back to, what was it, slide 22. Yeah, so here, exactly in this example, I was uh, wondering um, how you ensure that uh, your tile connects to the right uh, column. So you, uh, you explained how it connects to the, to the, to the, to the, to the right row. Uh, using the, you, you, you were encoding the row number uh, in the tile, right? Right. But, well, there is no right it. column. The these four tile types that this one. Sorry, just give me a sec. So the these four tile types that you see, mm -hmm. uh, these are the only ones that ever go in this column. So so they're all the right tile for this column. Or sorry, they're all the right tile for this row. Right. Whether they should go in this column depends on whether they match both glues that are in the previous column. Yeah, but what happened? What would happen if you would uh, introduce them into the whatever tube or whatever what, what, whatever it is? Uh, let's say a few seconds beforehand, so that they can fit into like lower in your picture. You you you, you see like in in a previous column rather. Oh, sorry, than our right. column. So. I'm thinking that columns are vertical and rows are horizontal. Are you exactly, saying column is yeah. horizontal? No, 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 no. Columns are, uh, are vertical. Well, the, the point is I'm not drawing the glues, but this tile might appear here or here or here. So it, it, it might be the right tile for that column depending on the two input bits here. So, so these four tiles will be chosen to go in this row at the various columns in that row. But yes, which but one is correct for that? But in some of the circuits you the introduced, in some of the circuits you introduced, you were using uh, different gates um, in uh, the same row in different columns, right? The opposite, the different. Uh, so I'm I'm saying, as I move up and down, I'm changing row, but I'm in the same column. Exactly. Yeah. As I yeah, move so left and right, I'm changing column, but I'm in the same row. So yeah, you can have true. different gates in different rows, but in sorry, in different in different rows, but at a particular row, every column is computing the exact same function. So you, you do not have oh, you cannot have a different gate here than here. Like all the threes are computing the exact same gate. Oh, that, okay. That's now a I get restriction it. of the model. I see. Okay, now I get it. Now I get it. Yeah. Okay, good, good. So I was under the impression. So that, that's the may, reason uh, that in the, the, the formal model described uh, here, we say you can choose whatever gates you want here, 
but those exact same functions have to be what's computed here and computed here. I see. Okay, now I get it. So you think of all of them put together, compute a single function from 0, 1 to the 6 to 0, 1 to the 6, and that function gets iterated. I understand. Okay, yeah, that that's answers my question. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, please. I, I, I'm not sure that I, I, I really got an answer. You mentioned that you can implement randomized algorithms. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, what is the source of randomness? You mentioned something about concentrations of tiles, but but what what if you like, given a circuit that you implement, where do you bring the, ra the randomness in order to compute? The, right. So uh, unfortunately, this slide shows only a deterministic one. So as I said, if if you have a gate, um, there are four tiles that correspond to it, one per truth table row defining the gate. If it's randomized, there's two gates. So you'd have eight tiles, and you'd have two that have a zero and a one, two that have a one and a one, two that have a zero and a zero, and two that have a one and a zero. So in particular, at this point, that other gate would also have a tile that has a zero and a one. So that tile in this one would be competing to bind here. And the relative concentrations would determine the probability of who succeeds. So this is this is not like a randomized algorithm in the uh, in the sense that that it's there is a, de a deterministic boolean function and a stream of of random bits that it uses in order to uh, uh, perform the computation. It's I like mean, you, you can think boolean of it. It's a circuit model. So how, how would you define a randomized boolean circuit model? You'd say, well, you're allowed to have deterministic gates, but you're also allowed to have randomized gates. So you have some gates where you can just say. This gate is going to compute this function with probability a third, and this other function with probability two thirds. So, uh, okay, I think that's you. the this, most natural. This, just think how how would you define any randomized Boolean circuit? You'd you'd probably do something like that. Let some of the gates flip a coin to determine what function they compute. Yes, that works. Thank you. Thank you. A great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just I'm curious. Can you give us an insight into how the sequences of the DNA tiles are identified? Like, yeah, so you, yeah, go on. Yeah, uh, just to say, is it is it composition based, or are you also looking at, for example, the kinetics of annealing, um, the order in which the bases find each other? Those sorts of questions. So there are kind of well, like battle tested models of DNA energy where you can you can say take a single. So just to pick one example, we didn't want individual strands to, to bind to each other too much. So here, here's my little cartoon picture. Right. We didn't, you know, we don't want to have like a long run of GC, GC that makes this thing bind to itself. We want this. So, so how, how would we get DNA sequences that do this, but not this? Well, there are well understood DNA energetics models that uh, essentially that can, they, they use some sort of clever dynamic programming where in polynomial time, like for a single strand, it's an n cubed algorithm where you can predict what's called the, the partition function energy, which is, okay, so we didn't do the following, but I'll say it as if we did the following, that you get, people sometimes use the, the minimum free energy. So of all the various structures that could form, which one's the most likely? There's exponentially many structures, but through clever dynamic programming based on uh, looking at substructures, you can actually, in only n cube time, figure out the minimum free energy structure. And if that looks like this, we wouldn't want that. But if the minimum free energy structure is actually everything unbound, that would be great. Or most things unbound, that would be great. So we run that to determine for a given particular choice of DNA sequences, is this good or not? Now, what we don't have is an algorithm that can help us choose the DNA sequences. There, we, you know, that's the one part where as a computer scientist, I should have been able to bust in with algorithmic cleverness. But yeah, we didn't know what to do. It's probably NP hard. I actually don't even know how to prove it's NP hard under certain models. But uh, so we, I wrote a stochastic local search algorithm that just randomly assigns DNA sequences, measures how bad it is, and then you just start picking ones that are causing problems and swap in a new random sequence, remeasure, keep doing that until you finally satisfy all the constraints. And what we do is we run it. And if we get an answer in less than a day, we decide we didn't make the constraints tough enough. We're really panicking. We want this to work well. So we would make all the constraints tighter until it took three days to run and give us an answer. And uh, that, that's more or less what we did. 
But under the hood, we're calling out to these existing algorithms, pieces of software called NuPack and Vienna RNA that measure the energetics of particular sequences of DNA and tell you how likely are they to bind to each other, how much they're going to bind. So we're just calling those over and over. OK. Uh, the swap is asking, can I say more about how the size of the tile set needed grows with the input length, the complexity of the computation, the number of input data items? Uh, well, so we just built one tile. In this, in this experiment, we just built one tile set. So the size of the tile set is 355. The way we program it is you pick out a subset of 100 of those tile types. Um, it, it's something like uh, 16 per gate. Uh, to implement the circuit. Um, and uh, so this one tile set doesn't, doesn't grow, but maybe what you mean is in some of those um, inspiring theorems I mentioned at the end where you, you can build bigger stuff, how, how, maybe that's what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, first of all, great talk. This is probably my favorite paper <laughs> I've ever read, uh, but that's exactly what I mean. Um, if you wanted to do a more complex computation, so maybe 32-bit integers or something, would you need, say, 800 tiles, or would that be like? It'd be like additive, e like e okay. each. Uh, so, so yeah, it would just scale with how many layers, or sorry, how many rows we want to do. But I actually started with 32, and it, I could never get the tubes to grow very well, and to this day, I don't know why. I think it might have to do with the natural curvature of the, the, the actually the single stranded DNA tiles want to be in a tube of circumference about 12 helices. So I, I, to this day, I don't know why 32 didn't work very well. So it's mainly a, a chemistry problem to make it bigger. But in terms of just designing the tiles, if we did 32, we'd need about twice as many. We would need around 700 tiles for this. It's just additive with how many different you know gate positions you have. And is there any limit to the length of the computation? For example, if there was something that went on for 10,000 steps, do you see any, any reason why it wouldn't work? Well, in this model, it, the thing grows forever, but whatever you want to know about what it's doing, you know after 64 layers. Because by the pigeonhole principle, no matter what your circuit does, if it's deterministic, if it's deterministic, it must repeat a bit string after 64, so. Yeah, no, I mean more generally. Generally in this model, if you have more tiles. Oh, well, this model is, like the, the, the key to, to this thing right here is the way this works is this is simulating a Turing machine that encodes the shape S. So the, the model, the full model where you can do more than the topology we did is Turing universal, you can simulate Turing machines, you can use that to do things like, like basically what this thing does is it, it simulates a single tape Turing machine that computes a spanning tree of the shape you want to assemble, and then looks at two integers that say, wh which point am I in the shape? And then based on the spanning tree, what are my children in that tree? I'm going to grow there and tell them to grow and, and do the same thing. So you can do some pretty crazy stuff in the full model. But that, but what we did was kind of more limited. Um, well, what makes it interesting is that as you grow to do the computation, well, you're taking up space. So there's a geometric component to this information processing that's not present in Turing machines that kind of matters. So that's what makes this interesting to work in as a theoretical model. Cool, thanks. Awesome, if, if I may have a short question. Um, does it make sense to talk about composition of, of those assemblies? So like build one assembly, build another, and then they get together. Yeah, so in the theoretical model, we, we call this sometimes the two-handed model, because when we describe it, we, we say build an assembly, build an assembly, and then they come together. Uh, there has been some uh, implementation of that at in some sense. So like one of the pictures I showed here, uh, where is it? Yeah, so this is an example. This is, so this is a DNA origami square right here. And this is 64 of them, an eight by eight grid of DNA origami squares. And actually the way they made this is they didn't just mix all 64 origamis and hope they come together. What they did is they did it in stages where they 
they mix these two and then they mix these two. And then once those formed, then they mixed this dimer with this dimer to form. So they did a kind of a high hierarchical approach. Uh, so yeah, th there is a sense in which you can do that. And it, if they didn't do that, they would not have gotten the yield they did here. And in fact, the yield wasn't great. It was like 1% to make these, but but it was even lower if they tried just mixing them all together at once. So that, so that is a way to kind of boost yield by you know assemble something in one test tube, assemble something in another, wash away whatever's excess and then mix them, so. I see, thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, then I thank you. Thank you once more for the great talk.